Hello, everyone, and welcome to Magnetic Cloud. I'm your MC, Ashley Sullivan from Cisco Investments. Um, so it looks like we've got a great group here, so I think we can go ahead and get started. We've got a super exciting agenda lined up for you today, bringing together our top executive leadership from our cloud and compute business, as well as those from Cisco Investments, alongside startup founders from great companies like Cohesity, Isovalent, TriggerMesh, and Serverless. Um, so with that, I am going to actually hand it over to Christian Kuhn, who is the head of portfolio development for Cisco Cloud and Compute at Cisco Investments. Christian, take it away. So thanks, Ashley, for that introduction. I'm excited to be here. As Ashley said, my name is Christian Kuhn, and I've been working closely with the startup community, bringing innovation to Cisco through my role here at Cisco Investments. Now. I wanted to kick us off by spending just a few moments to highlighting why magnetic cloud is important. Modern organizations, as we all know, increasingly rely on their development teams to drive product innovation. So developers are always running fast and the tools they use are very important. Cloud and cloud native world has brought a whole new set of tools to these developers, which really makes their lives a lot easier. The cloud offers speed, scale and agility, and this has led to an acceleration in cloud adoption. But with all of that comes additional complexity. Operations and cloud operation teams are struggling. They're trying to manage the applications and applications components that could be running in the cloud, across multiple clouds, in their on-premises environments, and even at the edge. To solve for these shifts, requires an entire innovation community comprised of corporates, customers, startups, founders, and investors, to name just a few. Let's talk a little bit about what Cisco is doing in this space. So as you can see on this slide, this is just a snapshot of all of the cloud startups that Cisco has either invested in or acquired in recent history. As you can see, when it comes to cloud, Cisco has been very active. And this really speaks to the DNA of Cisco as a company. We value and embrace technology that gets developed outside of our walls as much as we value the organic innovation we drive internally. I also wanted to share just quickly what are some of the key areas that we're tracking in this space. We're currently exploring companies that develop products or tools in, with cloud native capabilities, tools around automation, and also tools around data management. You'll hear more about Cisco's cloud strategy and our priorities in the coming segment. So I'm going to leave it at that. Start thinking of your questions now. Now, I wanted to call out one last thing. As Cisco Investments, we always walk into every conversation with an open mind and a desire to foster a mutually beneficial partnership. So much so that we did assign a dedicated resource to drive the acceleration of, of the company internally inside Cisco. For the cloud space, that's going to be me. I'm going to be your guide. I'm going to be that person that helps open up doors for you to our sales teams, to our customers and partners, and to our engineering teams and BUs. Cisco is a big company. There's a lot of avenues of value to explore, and I look forward to working with all of you. Now, if you are an entrepreneur working on a problem that you think could be interesting to Cisco, please just reach out to our team. We would love to hear from you and work together with you to make amazing things happen. Now, on that note, Ashley, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Christian. Okay, so with that, I'm actually going to introduce us to the next segment, which is moderated by Daniel Karp. He is our Director of Enterprise Networking and Cloud Investments and Acquisitions for Cisco. Um, just a quick heads up, everybody. So in this next segment, we're actually going to be taking live Q&A from the audience. Um, so start thinking of your questions now. With that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Daniel. Thanks, Ashley. Um, I'm really excited about this section. Uh, in a second, we're going to talk to quite a few interesting and exciting startups that uh, have been working with us and learn about their approaches. But before we get there, um, what we wanted to do with the next 35 minutes, even though we have content for probably four hours, 
is to have a conversation about our approach to hybrid cloud and also to talk through how we engage with the startup community, with the innovation community, as it relates to our platforms in a hybrid cloud environment. Um, so with that in mind, we brought in two subject matter experts that I'm really excited to talk to. Um, our general manager and SVP of our cloud and compute business, Costa Das, or KD, and Jeremy Foster, who leads all of our global sales for both cloud and cloud networking. So with that in mind, I'll hand it over to you guys. And uh, Katie, um, would you mind um, giving an intro about yourself and also to talk a little bit about what you do at Cisco? Yeah, happy to. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. This is such an exciting session, so I'm really looking forward to the, to the conversation and the questions um, that come in. My name is Kaustub Das. Uh, it's an incredibly complex name, so people call me KD, so that's that's how most folks know me. I'm the general manager of the Cloud and Compute business unit, and as part of that business unit, I lead this incredibly talented, passionate set of engineers, technologists, product leaders who are trying to create uh, the next set of solutions for our customers as they embrace hybrid cloud. Uh, that includes things in the space of automation, things in the space of um, cloud native technologies. Uh, and then in this journey, uh, we, we partner closely with Daniel and his team, the broad startup community, several of the leaders that I, uh, from those companies that are on this, uh, on, and on the agenda today. Uh, and of course, I partner with my dear friend, Jeremy, who's, who's closest to my customers. Uh, so Jeremy, maybe I hand it off to you to, to do a quick intro. Yeah, thanks, Katie. I'm Jeremy Foster. I'm the vice president of the CISG, what we call our cloud infrastructure software group. And that means that I get an opportunity to spend a tremendous amount of time with customers and working with our field, covering all the opportunities around the, the cloud networking business. So things like Nexus and how are we taking Nexus dashboard to enable customers to bring forward and automate the cloud, as well as what we're doing with Intersight and KD. Uh, and, and how we take that forward to make things easier as customers move towards hybrid cloud. And the other thing I get to spend a lot of time doing is really partnering up with KD and his team to help build the go-to-market in terms of how do we take things, how do we shape those things, and make them land effectively with our channel community and ultimately to the customers. Great to be here. Super excited about it. Right. So we've got the aspect of the engineering, the product, and the field um, with us today. So um, maybe we start with the most important thing, which is the priority. Um, so Katie, if you can talk to some of your team's priorities and your specific approach to hybrid cloud and the problem set that it imposes, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, Christian started to telegraph a little bit of this, uh, you know, in, in his opening, but what's What's happening is that we already had a rich ecosystem of innovation coming from um, the open source, coming from the startup community, coming from the public cloud, coming from vendors like ourselves. And what happened over the last year is all of that got accelerated, greatly accelerated. Like 90% of my customers say COVID accelerated their adoption of new technologies, accelerated the adoption of hybrid cloud. And in that, motion, um, a few things have happened. First of all, developers in these in my customers are, are starting to adopt some of these technologies. So they're moving fast, they're adopting these new technologies, and they're sometimes, sometimes running into issues because they're starting to move faster than the rest of the organization could keep up with them. On the other hand, um, a lot of the cloud ops teams, the infra ops teams, uh, they're trying to drive some sanity, some level of visibility and control so that these can scale. These can become, for lack of a better word, more enterprise grade, more controlled, more, more visibility, more, more, more full stack observability. And in that journey, it's also important to build an architecture and build a, um, build a set of tooling that is cloud neutral, build a cloud neutral hybrid cloud platform. Um, because in in that in doing so, you enable that control. You enable that ability to take technology from wherever it's created. It may be a certain vendor, a certain different public cloud vendor, the open source ecosystem, startups, um, 
to be able to democratize those technologies. And so that's what we're driving. And the approach is a platform approach. Uh, Intersight, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy mentioned Intersight. That's our hybrid cloud platform. Uh, we have, within Intersight, we have got services that are created by my teams internally, organically. We have services that we partner with, uh, with some of our um, uh, investments, other startups out there to bring those technologies onto that platform and then provide that common suite to our customers. And there's, there's areas where we integrate uh, in many ways on the product side and the technology side, certainly on the go-to-market side. So let me, you know, I think maybe Jeremy, you may have a unique perspective on some of this as well as you, as you look at it from, from the customer lens and the sales lens. Yeah, Katie, I mean, I think customers, the interesting thing here is that they're really all across the gamut in terms of where they are on their hybrid cloud journey. So you, we talk to customers in one meeting, customer is, is going all cloud. We talk to another customer in the next meeting, they're starting to figure out how are they going to start leveraging these cloud, uh, this cloud process to start bringing their applications outside of just the four walls of their data center. And then we even talk to customers who have been in the cloud for a while and are saying, wow, it's, it's pretty expensive. We need to figure out how to get this stuff back on prem because we think we can operate it most efficiently. And I think that's what really customers are after is how do they do this cloud migration and do it because IT is an operations game. How can we operate their estate as most effectively as possible? And in fact, even this morning on our investor day, Chuck talked a little bit about it in terms of what we're trying to bring, as you say, a platform appro approach, it's cloud agnostic. And what we want to do is help customers, no matter where they are in that journey, be able to pick up and accelerate to their optimal state, wherever that is, on-prem, in the cloud, and that's where everybody's headed towards hybrid. So I think um, that's that's kind of the customer lens right now. Well, thank you for that, Jeremy and, and Katie, and um, you know, both are important perspectives. I want to double-click on, on a few things that were said here, because uh, you guys have actually covered a lot in very few <laughs> sentences. Um, so I think some of the key takeaways here are the democratization of cloud and being applicable and being relevant everywhere and serving customers everywhere. So the neutrality element is of importance. Um, Katie, with that in mind, maybe we double click on sort of that platform approach that encompasses both our own set of developments and, and solutions, as well as some of the third parties and some of the uh, partners that we, um, that we have that work with us. Can you tell, tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when we went about uh, building Intersight, we wanted it to be a platform that can be a service delivery platform. Uh, those services may be ones we create. Those services may be ones we uh, acquire from, from acquisitions we make. Those services may be ones we partner with interesting uh, portfolio companies out there um, and interesting startups out there. What does that mean? That means that that platform must enable easy onboarding of services. That platform must have obviously just the basics of a common sign-on, common on. I mean, those are common role-based access controls. But that also that platform should have things like um, global search, things like a common inventory, things like being able to look across each one of these individual services onto other parts of the of the of the of the platform suite, um, and be able to kind of do more because that platform affords that, that ability. Um, and that strategy has borne out because you know, we, we released uh, four or five new services in the last six, seven months. We're gonna be at the same pace going forward. Some of them, those were ours, some of those came from others. But there's one other fundamental thing that that enables. Um, as innovation and technology becomes part of a, of a common platform, it not only bridges technologies, it bridges teams. Because at our customers, there are teams that are deep on the application side. There are teams that are deep on the cloud operation side. There are teams that are deep on, on infrastructure, whether it's network or computer storage. It is important that these teams have a common vocabulary and a common way to communicate. And by looking at a common platform and driving those linkages, they now have that common vocabulary and common way to communicate. And that is super important. Uh, also underpins our, our FSO, our full stack observability strategy in how we are kind of bridging those teams. Um, I'll tell you that the, there's, there's enough of a challenge in getting some of these technologies up and running 
But when something goes wrong, it's even a deeper challenge to diagnose where where to remediate uh, that problem and how quickly you can get to that remediation and how much the the intelligence in those technologies enables you to get there. That makes a lot of sense, Katie. I think um, I think the the interesting thing about the approach is it's it's quite different than what we've had a few years ago, which is actually a really good segue to the fact that we do have questions from the audience. And one pretty interesting one that just came in, um, I would love to share with, with both of you, Katie and Jeremy. So um, if you can give the lens of, from a, of, the, of the answer from a product perspective as well as you know, how the field is reacting to it, that would be great. So the question from the audience is, if we, are, if we were going to compare Cisco's cloud strategy to what it was a few years ago, what has changed and uh, what would you say the main difference is? Yeah, I, I can start and, uh, you know, Jeremy, jump in uh, or, or follow on. Um, so I think our change in strategy mirrors uh, what our customers have gone through uh, as well. Uh, you know, if you look at a few years ago, it was around the cloud is interesting, open source is interesting, and there are pieces that are interesting that I want to recreate on my side. So it was it was, it was very geared towards how can I get a cloud-like experience at home? Uh, it was almost as if we wanted to, we liked some things, we, we wanted to bring it home and bring our, make our home more elastic, more automated, more digitized, more, you know, all of those kinds of things. Uh, by the way, that in itself is an awesome proposition. That is a good thing to do. I think where our customers and where our strategy has moved to now is to say, listen, all of these are ingredients of our IT infrastructure. Um, the cloud is an ingredient, the public cloud is an ingredient, but there are interesting things that each of the public cloud providers are doing that are quite different from each other. And I want to, I want to get all of those ingredients in place. Um, I, you know, the, uh, the automation that is afforded by innovation that's coming out of, out of the startup community is, is an, is a key ingredient. I don't want to miss out on that. And so that our customers don't want to miss out on any of the innovation happening any of these places, whether it's public cloud, startup community, open source, vendors like Cisco. And so our strategy has then been to say, how do we enable that? How do we enable that in a way that is um, that is one that our customers can have confidence in? They, they want to be relying on technology that works, that is scalable, that is reliant, re resilient, and because at the end of the day, millions and billions of dollars are on the line for these guys, right? So I think that's our approach is how do we create a solid platform that is usable by our customers that they trust, that has the controls, that has the security controls, the RBAC controls, the cross-platform, the common tooling, the common vocabulary, um, and has been put through the paces. I mean, a lot of times when we work with um, uh, some of the innovation, uh, innovative companies in, in the startup community, uh, we find that once we get to scale, that's when we get to harness new interesting use cases, but we also get to really harden the product. And, and that's what, and so we are enabling, our strategy has moved to enabling those experiences for our customers, enabling them to have a toolkit of innovation, whether that comes from startup, open source, public cloud, Cisco, other vendors, and be able to operate that in a common, common platform. And, and from a sales perspective, Daniel, I mean, we've really gone through a transition over the last few years to obviously within inside of CSG, we have a large hardware portfolio with UCS, Nexus, et cetera. But we've gone from talking about and competing against on a hardware side of things versus hardware uh, or just kind of getting to the next customer conversation around their next refresh cycle and transitioning that into leading with software, leading with the capabilities of the platforms that we're delivering and how customers are gonna experience the value, not just speeds and feeds and all those types of things. And that's been, I think, a key enabling factor to why we can work with this community and bring these solutions forward. So as Katie's building and we're having a lot of success uh, with working with these types of companies uh, in, in our sales process and, and talk a little bit more about that later. No, that makes, that makes a ton of sense, Jeremy. And, and I think you said something really important here that I, I would love to unpack. So 
you know, elevating the conversations with customers and just you know, refresh cycles and very tactical things related to you know, the hardware boxes, right? Um, into a conversation that's broader about capabilities, you know, um, um, objectives, business-oriented uh, questions. Um, that required us to partner with startups, to partner with the innovation community. Can you talk a little bit about um, what makes a good partnership? How does a startup work with us? How is the field reacting to that, those type of conversations with our partners, as well as how are we taking those conversations or those joint solutions um, to the customers and how do they uh, look at us from that perspective? Yeah, I, it's a great question, Daniel. I mean, so let's just say a hypothetical here, we're looking at a particular solution from one of the innovation partners and how can we get it to go to market? I guess the advice I would give, I, I kind of have a little framework that I use around the four S's on this one, right? So, so the first one is keep it simple. So the second one is building solutions. The third one is around sales alignment. And, and the fourth one is just scale. And why is keeping it simple so important? If you take a look at the structure of our field, we have account managers that are responsible for accounts. They cover this portfolio that's so huge. So we're talking to the cloud community here about hybrid cloud innovations, but imagine an account manager who's responsible for cloud collaboration, security, I mean, you name it, it'll take the rest of the call for me to name how broad their portfolio is. That's one of the powers of Cisco as a company to work with, but it means that you can't necessarily build a solution that is extremely complicated or hard to quote or hard to get to market. And, and that's really where the solutions piece comes in. If you look at where we've had a lot of success, things like Cohesity, who you'll hear from later, you know, we're taking a solution that our field is naturally selling already and extending that to give a, a more complete offer for a customer, right? Like, let's not just talk about what we can do from a primary storage, but let's talk about data management and how you can do that from an end-to-end -end perspective, for example. And that's really important as well, because now our field is already talking to that same buying persona. They're already having a conversation. What you're doing is enabling them to sell more, which is what our team loves to do is sell more, right? And, and I think that's important on the sales alignment front. Um, the other thing here is you know, executive alignment is really important when we're, when we're working together, because we've got to have sales executive alignment because we have thousands of folks. And so from a scale perspective, sales alignment becomes extremely important. We have so many people that if we don't do it right, if we don't stage it in certain uh, ways as we bring a product to market, we will literally just crush somebody with 10,000 inbound phone calls, right? So we set up processes to avoid those kinds of issues and to enable our field, frankly, to be able to go do it as much on their own as humanly possible, which is great for the, for the folks out there on the phone because they wanna sell more and they don't wanna make it too complicated for our team. And that's really where the scale piece comes in, right? Can we manage that effectively with this type of a solution? Is the solution one that actually scales to do that? Because not every solution can be bespoke because it just won't work within kind of our motion of carrying these large portfolios to market. So those are kind of the four things I think about. And in terms of our field, our field loves technology and innovation. I mean, we have uh, 800 specialists on the data center and data center uh, SE side from a, a CISG portfolio perspective. And we have about, you know, 800 field CTOs out there that love to tell us about all the latest and greatest innovations and all the ones that Katie and I should be evaluating and bringing on board on a daily basis. I mean, they, they absolutely love anything new in their portfolio to put in front of the customer. That's, that's, that's super helpful, Jenny. Um, I, I want to go back to another question from the audience that actually ties into this one. Um, there's a question from the audience around how do we select startups and technologies to partner with, and how do we enable um, the vision that, that we just talked about? Um, so I can start, but uh, Katie and Jeremy, maybe you keep me honest and make sure that I don't complete, I'm not completely off. Um, so first of all, there is no one way to partner with us, and there's no one way to basically start an engagement with us. Effectively, it can come from everywhere. It can come from the field, it can come from product, it can come from engineering, it can come from our team. Um, our role as a team from a fiscal investment standpoint is to try to see uh, what are the market trends and learn about the landscape and the market trends that are um, either disrupting us or are um, augmenting our solutions or will help us move forward. And so, we would engage with startups, the product teams would engage with startups. Um, and what we try to do is we try to actually customize the engagement so that it's not a one-size-fits-all, 
we're trying to figure out what are the gaps that we have in our portfolio, what are the customers requiring, what are the trends that we need to be attentive to, and how does that fit into Cisco? So it's a very collaborative effort between multiple teams, which, is, which means that it will take time to engage with us. But once the ship moves, it actually goes pretty, pretty fast. Um, and so you'll see a few examples, uh, you know, moving forward in, in the next session of, of companies that have partners with us, partnered with us. But um, the the answer is, uh, it really is about building a thesis, a hypothesis about the, the market, and how does a startup, how does an innovate, the innovation trend fit into that hypothesis, and how can actually we match that trend with buying personas and what our customers, what our field is looking for. So uh, that's that's my short answer. But uh, I don't know, Katie and Jeremy, if you have anything. Yeah, I can I can I can add in a little bit. You know, that's what that's really well said, Daniel. I mean, I think the what my advice would be, you know, uh, to also study Cisco and our strategy because it's, you know, there's so much rich innovation that that the startup community and the technologists out there are driving. And they solve really hard, really interesting problems, but it needs to fit into a use case that a customer is dealing with, and it needs to fit into a solution set that Cisco is taking to market. So how does that become complementary? How does that get integrated into the Cisco platforms and portfolio? How, do, how can we tell a story that these things, this innovation that you're driving is it's really complementary and really kind of turbocharges everything that Cisco is doing. I think that makes it super powerful. And when that when that's that, when that's enabled, at least from one product lens, when that's enabled, it becomes really easy to move fast. Um, um, and and everything else you said is correct, which is once we move, it just it's uh, it's exponential. Yeah, absolutely. And the only thing I would add to that, both what you said is just when you look at how we're trying to sell and we're trying to really sell across all these. Uh, domains, if you will, you know, how do we bring together solutions from EN back to cloud networking, back to all these different pieces of Cisco. So anything your solution does that can help tie all the functional groups within Cisco together is, is, is valuable, right? So those are things you should be looking at as you're building solutions and bringing them to us. It's not to say, you know, hey, hey, this is how this helps you, KD. That's important. But how can it help KD and KD's peers in security and EN and across the board? And if you get that right, then I think you know, it uh, shows much more effectively. All right. So we have the best question from the audience so far because we actually have prepared for it. Um, so here's, here's a question. From a cloud perspective, what do you think Cisco can give as an investor that you can't get from another VC? I'm happy to take that, but I think the best way to answer it is through example. And I think we have ample examples of that. So um, Katie and, and Jeremy, I don't know who wants to take it first, but maybe we talk about uh, specific examples of companies that we partner with. Yeah, no, happy to. And and I think um, when we when when startups look at Cisco, um, they sh what they should see is certainly a technology leader, a very trusted name, a a valued brand. Um, but also immense scale, right? This is just immense scale, and um, and what it, it's it's much more than than the investment. What what our partners in the startup community get from us is the ability to really reach that scale. And it's not about the dollars and cents. It's not about that because once you get to that scale, you get to really harden your product. That, you know, you, you, things get put through the paces, and and I think there's there's many many examples of of companies we've we've invested in and then acquired, um, uh, whether in the hyperconverged space, uh, the companies we have uh, partnered with, like like Cohesity, where we've kind of driven a very good joint go to market motion. Um, we get that. The other thing we get is uncovering new use cases. Right there are <laughs> when you when you get to organizations that we deal with at Cisco. These are large, complex, unique, and truly kind of organizations that push the boundary of what the technology can and sometimes should do. Um, and when you do that, you get, you get a very rich set of requirements back that enhances the product, makes it richer, not only more resilient, but also richer. 
Um, and, and and that is a huge that's a huge value to actually to everyone to the customer, to the to the startup, um, and and to Cisco. Um, and and that is kind of invaluable. Again, we've we've partnered with um, uh, with HashiCorp. Uh, is a great example where we said how do how to code in a hybrid cloud uh, world, and that integration with Intersight, with HashiCorp, two two leaders and a really powerful technology has unlocked new use cases for the customer, has unlocked new use cases for Hashi, and has unlocked kind of a, a, a new value that Cisco can provide in partnership with, 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 uh, with this company. Now, we will, I think we'll talk later with, uh, with Trigger Mesh and, and, and leaders from that company. And that's a great, I mean, a great example of a company that's starting to explore um, spaces that are, that are super exciting, super new, and then, but also being very practical about it and saying, how do we kind of bridge today's world in a very pragmatic way and enable enable really rich use cases? Uh, and the way we worked with 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 Mark and his team are to look at it with customers that uh, that are joint customers today, right? So these are very real, very very customers we deeply understand, um, trying to do interesting things. Um, so it's 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 much you know it's it's a it's a great experience it's a it's it's a, it's an investment of time and energies uh, from both sides but it really pays off and it's it's actually terrific it's really fun it is it's a lot of fun and I think it's really customer impacting Katie you you mentioned Hashi so I guess I'll I'll, I'll talk about Cohesity a little bit and maybe I'll even test out my my framework here right but I mean when you start off with <laughs> keeping it simple. But we really worked with the, with the, the Cohesity team to make sure that we could build uh, a framework for us to be able to layer in their software on top of our solutions and take it to market in a, in a very easy, repeatable process that it took a little bit of time to get implemented. It took, to your point, Daniel, you know, you got to move slow, slow to move fast later, right? And so I think we got that right. And then from a solution perspective, we started off, like I said earlier, from just expanding the use cases around primary storage to being able to handle secondary storage and and things that we that we don't do natively within within our platform. But what's really interesting now is we're expanding that out in terms of security use cases. So look at Skylakes Medical is a great example of a, of a mutual customer where we actually help them recover from a ransomware attack, which is obviously terrible that someone would ever do that to uh, someone in the medical community, but pretty awesome that the technology stack that we put together across the two companies could help them recover and it was, it's a, just a fantastic story. And so I would recommend taking a look at that one. Uh, from a sales alignment perspective, and we, we have regular conversations with Mohit, his team, and our field absolutely loves engaging with their field. And it's simple enough for scale to be able to take it out and let our field sell it on their own, which Mohit loves, because that's sort of the point of the whole, of the whole game in engaging with Cisco. So that's, uh, that's what I would say on that one. All right. So I, I, I want to be cognizant of time. We have eight minutes, and there's another question from the audience that I want to make sure that you guys cover, but also there's one additional question that is on everybody's mind that, that I would love for you to, to, to tackle. Uh, so let's go with the, uh, with the question from the audience first, um, and then leave off enough time to, for the last one. Um, so the question from the audience is, can you explain uh, Cisco's Intersight offering? What should startups know about it? What might be some partnership opportunities there. Yeah, I, I can take that one. And obviously, you know, Larry and Jeremy. Um, so Intersight is our hybrid cloud platform. And like I was alluding to before, we, we invested a lot of effort, thought, uh, and deep kind of architectural cycles on building it as a platform. And it does a few different things. Uh, it's, it certainly has a role in managing our infrastructure and our partner infrastructures in a much more intelligent fashion, in a much more telemetry-driven, proactive, like managed from the cloud uh, manner. That's, that's kind of baseline. But it's also a service delivery platform for cloud automation and, and, um, and, and cloud native capabilities. So for example, um, some of our customers want to drive cloud automation through workflows and in a very low code, no code manner. Well, there's a service within Intersight that allows them to do that. And that allows them to actually string together workflows um, across our technologies, but across our partner technologies and to string together those workflows in a way that is, that is pretty much drag and drop, but drag and drop with 
RBAC, with controls, with logging on who did what. If something gets fat fingered, we know who and what happened where. And we have the ability to then roll back in a very elegant fashion to prior states. Um, but some customers want to drive infrastructure as code uh, and some of these new technologies in a hybrid cloud fashion. So there's a there's a HashiCorp Terraform service within uh, within InnerSight that allows us to do that. So it, think of InnerSight as a suite of services, some of these on the automation front. But on the other axis, on the cloud native side, we've got a InnerSight Kubernetes service, which is a container as a service platform um, for for our customers to really get the same kind of ability they they have to, to spin up containers, but do that in a way that's cloud neutral. And as we brought that service on, we've now started to light up other add-ons to that. So our service mesh managers are yet another service within, within um, inner side that then allows uh, us to drive kind of um, IT level visibility and controls on top of service meshes that are built on Istio. Um, and that came as a result of, a, of an acquisition that we did and then integrated that technology as part of the InnerSight platform. So what InnerSight does for our customers is it provides that unifying platform for cloud automation and a unifying cloud platform for cloud native capabilities. Katie, I think uh, I think Jeremy, what would be great is if you can talk to the customer's reaction to the set of capabilities as it relates to both the delivery methodology, so you know, SaaS and cloud delivered services, and also if you can address the flexibility, and the, the fact that you know you're you can Lego block the type of services that you need as a customer and just pick and choose those that are relevant to you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you look at what we've delivered from an InterSight platform as a SaaS engine, if you will, for just basic server management, right? There's no one else in the industry that can do it quite like we do it. And that's a fantastic starting point in terms of laying down those private cloud environments that Katie is talking about, because obviously we have a huge uh, install base out in data centers around GCS. And you start looking at where that, that goes from a SaaS management perspective, start putting edge solutions out there where they're going to need support and you have you know, 150 locations, and how are we going to go across 150 locations and manage it effectively? Well, InterSight is a great platform to start. And then from there, that's where customers start to go, wait a minute, I can, you can do all this other stuff on top of that functionality. It's just making it easier for me to understand how to maintain my estate, if you will, from a, from a technology perspective and making it easier to do things like actually you know, a memory dim is going to go bad. We can automate that whole process. So we can automate the physical stuff. And I think that's where a lot of times that uh, InterSight started out, and that's that's because of our install base where we've started those conversations. And now, like I was saying earlier, we're really leading with, well, what are you doing from a cloud perspective? How are you managing rolling out Kubernetes within your organization? Do you need us to help make that easier for you? And how do you want to maintain that over time? Those are the conversations that we're moving into because of KD's team and the innovation that they're enabling us to have those conversations. So it's 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 been a real positive reaction from customers. I mean, obviously, anything you can do to, to make it easier, uh, that's that's what they're looking to do, right? Is just to optimize operations, and and that's what Intersight does. Daniel, you may be you may be timing out right now. I don't know if you're still there or not. It looks like Daniel's connection maybe went down. So um, I know we only have one minute left. Um, and I know that Daniel's last question was just about if there was one trend that you guys were going to keep your eyes on over the next, you know, six months or one year, um, what would that what would that trend be? And I'll, I'll let you guys, you know, pick two if you have two favorites, like you can't pick a favorite child. So these questions about a single trend are always tricky because there's so much, there's so much happening in this in the space, and uh, and it's all exci it's all exciting. Um, I'll, I'll pick two, like you said, Ashley. Um, you know, cloud native and cloud automation. I think those are two key uh, two key trends to keep an eye on. There's a there's just a lot of innovation in both of those spaces, and there's a lot of need for us to simplify and make that much more consumable uh, for our customers in both those spaces. So if there's two things I'm watching closely, it's how do we enable cloud native, which is how are apps gonna be built in the future? How do we enable that trend and cloud automation? 
our apps going to be run in the future um, across across a very multi-cloud distributed world. I agree, Katie. I think those are top of mind for me as well, right? What's going on in the container environment, the container networking space, security space, uh, as we look towards the future of cloud native application development, that's, that's, that's the one I'll pick, Ashley. Great, Daniel. Um, sorry, I stepped in as a moderator for just a second because yes. I saw that your connection thank, went down. Thank you but for that. For anything else that, that you want to say before we wrap up this went, segment? No, my internet was completely down, so I appreciate you jumping in, Ashley. But um, with that in mind, Katie and Jeremy, thanks a lot for all your detailed answers. I hope the audience got a chance to learn a little bit more about what we do, our approach, and also how to engage with us. This is probably the most important thing. We are a platform. We are looking for third parties. We are looking for partners. We are looking to work with startups in the innovation community. Um, so thank you uh, for spending time and, and talking to us about that approach. And with that in mind, um, back to you, Ashley. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel and KD and Jeremy. You are all fantastic, and that was a great segment. Um, so we're actually going to move over to our next segment of the day. So I'm going to pass it back over to uh, my friend Christiane uh, for the next panel. Um, but before I do that, I will say I've been seeing a lot of questions come into the Q&A, which has been fantastic. We're answering as many as we possibly can, um, but keep them coming because we have not only the people who are answering them live, but we also have Cisco Investments team members and others from Cisco who can help answer those questions if we can't get to all of them during the segment. Okay, over to you, Christian. Thanks, uh, Ashley. And uh, so we just heard from Katie and Jeremy about some of the shifts in this in the industry. Now we are really now we're going to start talking to leading founders that we work with and learn more about how they are building companies in the space. Before we kick it off, I just wanted to let you know that you are free to submit questions at any time. You can even start right now. Questions for the session is already open. Okay. So let's get to it. On this panel, we've got three CEOs from companies that we at Cisco are very excited about. We've got Dan Wendland from Isovalent, we've got Mark Inkle from Trigger Mesh, and Austin Collins from Serverless. Now, I'm going to let these panelists answer their question, uh, introduce themselves via the question. So I'm going to kick it right off. Uh, panelists, are you ready? We're ready. I, I see you all there. Let's get let's it going. Let's do it. First question, uh, tell us more about yourself and what inspired you to start your companies. And Mark, I'm going to ask you to kick it off for us. All right. Um, so uh, my name is Mark Hinkle and I was the co-founder of Trigger Mesh. And we do um, <clears throat> a multi-cloud integration on cloud native architecture. Um, if you ask the former bosses of myself and my co-founder, Sebastian, they would probably tell us we don't tell you we don't deal with authority well, and we had no uh, choice than to work for ourselves. But uh, honestly, why we wanted to start Trigger Mesh was we had seen how enterprise software worked, and we thought we could make better decisions than we could in a larger organization. We could move faster, and we were really interested about the cloud native space. Uh, we were early adopters of DevOps practices and and cloud native. Um, and so we didn't want to be the punchline of a Dilbert cartoon. So we got down and dirty into what we saw in cloud native and where we thought it was going. And we saw that that the proliferation of cloud services was, was going to cause a problem. The problem was you didn't have a way for all of these disparate uh, cloud services to work with your legacy infrastructure. And that's what, what led us to founding uh, Trigger Mesh. And um, today we're trying to build a cloud native integration platform that is less disruptive than lifting and shifting to the cloud, but still provides you all of the cloud native agility and scale and speed that you get from technologies like Kubernetes and, and others. Uh, now, Austin, it might be good to pivot over to you now because you're playing in a very similar space, right? In fact, highly adjacent, I would say. Yes, very much so. Um, so I'm the CEO and founder of Serverless Inc. We make uh, software development tools for building serverless architectures, aka architectures with really low operational overhead. 
And my, my story is really a, a scratch my own itch scenario that turned out to resonate with startups and global 2000s alike. So uh, I'm a software developer and like most software developers, I just want to build more and manage less, right? That is what most software developers want. They love the innovation, delivering great products, but the uh, getting bogged down in complexity, maintenance and uh, scaling issues, it's, it's not so fun. And if you look at the cloud industry as a whole, they get this. And what we're seeing uh, over the last five years is a lot of uh, cloud vendors uh, coming out with new infrastructure services that are kind of higher levels of abstraction that target business problems. So for example, you know, 10 years ago, you might ask Amazon for a virtual machine. Uh, today you ask them, hey, what's, what's in this image? Or can you convert this video file for me? And as a developer, I love these abstractions because they go back to my goal of building more and managing less. So in 2015, I set out on this journey to build a developer tool, an application framework that uh, focused on architectures that use these services exclusively. And kind of the, the goal there was architectures where you don't code and maintain every aspect of it, but it's more focused on outsourcing. And so that project was uh, is called the Serverless Framework, and uh, it caught on uh, immediately. And <clears throat> um, turns out, you know, big global 2000 companies, everybody wants to build more and manage less. And, you know, from there, I, I guess I kind of stumbled into a shifting of the default cloud architectural model, which is more about like how much, you know, how much can we outsource? How much, you know, less can we use in house? Um, and fast forward to today, it, it's almost as if, uh, you know, in this era of hyper competition, if you want to keep up, you know, let alone lead, you can't build and maintain every aspect of your, your technology stack. Like it's, it's just too hard. Um, so serverless architectures kind of as a result of this project and a lot of great services coming out in the cloud industry is kind of, uh, the new default cloud architectural model. And, uh, if everybody's after it, it's a, it's a growing theme and that inspired me to build a company around this. Got it. Um, thanks. Thanks for that. Awesome. And then Dan. Hello, folks. My name is Dan Welland. I'm CEO and co-founder of a company called Isovalent. We're probably best known for our open source project Cilium which is leading uh, Kubernetes networking and security. So I've spent pretty much my whole career in Linux networking and security, most of that in the open source space. Uh, I was one of the first employees at a company called NICERA, which kind of led that first wave of software-defined networking. We had a project called Open vSwitch, which drove, uh, we kind of made the Linux kernel programmable from a networking perspective. And this is what was bought by VMware and became VMware NSX. But I think even during that first wave of kind of the SDN movement, what we saw was we were just taking kind of the, or the, the physical networking constructs like firewalls and switches and virtualizing them, much the same way kind of a VMware was virtualizing a server and making it a virtual server. But even though the network was virtualized, you were still dealing with these low-level identifiers like IPs and ports. And I think a common theme you've heard today is how do you get better higher-level abstractions that are easier for people to reason about, right? particularly as you're building applications as these microservices now right, that are making API calls here and there, thinking about how would networking work? How would a developer want to describe their firewall policies if they were drawing it on a whiteboard? It would be this service is making this API call to this service or fetching this data from that database. So thinking about how can the network operate at that higher level granularity and get past these low level kind of IPs and ports. And that was really kind of what I think the passion that drove us, and I'll talk later about this kind of Linux kernel technology called eBPF that we also co-maintain that is really kind of let, let, lets us inject that additional intelligence into the Linux kernel and kind of bring it up that layer from IPs and ports to services and API calls. And I've been working in this space my whole life, and at least for me, that's super exciting and that's a, that's a super fun mission um, to be building. So super excited to be on, the, on that path. Well, of course, we couldn't agree more. Um, now. This segment really is about being successful in cloud native. And I'd like to ask each of you if you can talk a little bit about your most successful customer and why do you think, uh, you know, what do you think at least sets them apart from the rest? Now, Austin, I'm going to come to you first on that one. What sets them apart in the serverless domain? Let's see. So we've, 
you know, we, we've been doing this for a little while, and I think I've kind of become the unofficial standard for doing serverless development across the industry. And we've got fantastic customers like Nordstrom, Air Canada, Coca-Cola, and uh, a lot of smaller companies too. And I think across the larger companies and the smaller companies in the serverless domain, the thing that uh, really generates the most success is, is this, this philosophy of serverless first. And that is when the IT leader um, kind of comes in and says, look, we're going to, you know, we really value innovation, pace of innovation. And uh, we really value uh, low overhead and kind of low operational costs over the long run. And so everything that we build from here on out has to be on a serverless architecture that uses these high levels of abstraction, whether it's on a public cloud provider or uh, high level abstractions on top of Kubernetes, for example. And they come in uh, to their, you know, a line of business in a larger company, or most startups are adopting this these days, uh, to be frank. And they practice this philosophy of like, we have to make it work in the serverless architecture as much as we can. And only if we absolutely, the use case does not fit, do we bring in other technologies. And so that really sets the, the tone uh, for the engineering team. And the choice is we do this at, at our organization. If we bring in something that's not serverless, I have to explicitly approve it. Um, and as a business operator myself, I'm you know, very cognizant of the costs that come, the carry costs coming from you know, bringing in complex infrastructure. So, you know, some examples of successful customers, you know, Coca-Cola is a great one. Uh, a lot of their vending machines actually have an integrated communication system. And uh, the, the communication system reports uh, to, um, uh, to their systems if the vending machine is broken or it's running out of beverages or something and all that's built on serverless architectures and that's the result of you know, i remember early in 2016 they were one of the first companies to adopt a serverless first mindset and it started with an it leader over there who just came in and said this is what we're doing we're going to try and build all these different new projects in a serverless architecture um, so there's a ton of examples like that uh, in addition in the startup world you know, we have every single day a ton of startup companies are being built uh, with our tools because they have to innovate fast and they cannot be saddled with uh, complexity and high operational costs. So a ton of examples like this, I, I guess one that kind of comes to mind lately is there's a there's a media company uh, called Barstool Sports um, and they actually have a very small engineering team, super smart group of engineers. Uh, they're They're super resourceful but very, very small. And they practice a serverless first philosophy from day one. And that whole company, everything you see them do, it's 90% serverless at the end of the day. And they have done an incredible amount of uh, stuff, just reached high levels of productivity um, and exited at about like a half billion dollars like a year or two ago. And I just, I love stories like that in particular. That's, you know, building the company, it's exciting, uh, it's, you know, one of the most interesting experiences of my life. But what gets me out of bed is the startups that have very little resources and can do so much and reach these heightened levels of productivity through this serverless first mindset. Um, and that stuff, I just, there's so many stories of that in our community. And again, that's, that's what really gets me out of bed in the morning. Thanks a lot, Olson. I'm certainly going to be thinking of you whenever I get a drink from a vending machine in the future. So, you know, thanks for that. Um, Mark, Dan, any either one of you want to go next? Mark, I'm going to nominate you. All right, sure. Um, I would say that probably the the most interesting use case and very very cloud native customer that we have is PNC Bank, and um, just as Austin alluded to, is that serverless is at the forefront of. Um, many, if not most, uh, organizations to to deploy new systems. So what PNC did is they actually used cloud native technologies to implement what they call policies code. And PNC is the seventh largest bank in America, one of the top hundred in the world, and they have an incredible amount of governments and regulation considerations for their systems, and so. What they had done in the past was they were running uh, government scripts to understand if their systems were in compliance or not. It was run by a person who compiled reports. And what they did was they codified all of their governance scripts into serverless functions. And then they 
hosted that on Kubernetes and uh, Knative. And then using Trigger Mesh and Apache Kafka to stream events and trigger those events, they're creating real-time enforcement of their governance policies uh, via a serverless framework. Uh, no pun intended, Austin, but they are using a, uh, a serverless functions to run run their systems. And what, what's really interesting about them is that they have replicated a cloud native infrastructure on-prem because they had considerations around control and security and other things um, to start, but they're looking to expand the way that they do most everything with a cloud native, serverless, more simple, abstracted way to, to uh, deploy, manage, and actually enforce the uh, rules around their, their architecture. So I think they are the poster child for where DevOps is going as far as infrastructure as code, policy as code, and what we at Trigger Mesh call integration as code. Got it. Thanks, Mark. Makes a lot of sense, and I'm sure there's <laughs> tremendous time savings attached uh, to that uh, to that implementation. So, Dan. Well, it, it's funny that Mark just mentioned poster child because my initial reaction to this question was customers are like children; you can't pick a favorite, right? Uh, <laughs> but um, so I won't pick a particular customer. But you know, we work on lot with lots of enterprises, kind of on their cloud native journey. You know, usually when people are starting out with Kubernetes, they're just trying to get Kubernetes working. And that's not really where we engage. They're just trying to get their first apps up and running. We really jump in once they have mission critical workloads that are running on Kubernetes, right? This is the kind of stuff that, hey, how do you pass a compliance check with these workloads in your Kubernetes environment? How do you do an incident investigation? How do you troubleshoot if to find out if a firewall policy is dropping this traffic between service A and service B? And you know, across the board from financials like Capital One to kind of um, you know, SaaS companies like Adobe and Datadog, streaming services like Sky, all the Peacock stuff um, runs through Cilium. We've got lots of different people, even a lot of telco interests lately around 5G. Across the board, I think the trend we see is that the people that are succeeding with this journey to cloud native and Kubernetes, they're shifting the mindset from hey, how do my application teams automate the provisioning of individual infrastructure components? Like, oh, I'm automating my VMs, I'm automating my load balancers, I'm automating this, to everything being an integrated part of the Kubernetes platform so that that level of individual components are not even exposed to the application teams. Kubernetes itself has the abstractions for firewalling, for load balancing, for provisioning containers, et cetera. And so it's really a massive shift in terms of you know, you used to have different teams that maybe manage load balancers and firewalls and your servers and all of this. And the people who are really succeeding, you know, will be on a single call with a single Kubernetes platform team. And you'll go from talking about security and incident investigations to load balancing to troubleshooting and observability. And they're really consolidating all that all in one team. So they're making a cohesive, higher level offering to their application teams. Right. So again, I mean, it hits on some of the same points that Austin hit on. Your application teams don't want to deal with those infrastructure details. How do you give them an offering that helps them focus on building, you know, the application business logic, but doing that in a way that is secure and aligned with all of your enterprise requirements like compliance and all of those types of things. That's really the core challenge and consolidating that within a single platform team, um, I think is really what helps our kind of largest and most successful Kubernetes companies do what they do. Thanks, uh, thanks. That, that makes a lot of sense. And it certainly resonates also with what we heard Katie and Jeremy say, say earlier. Um, so we've got a question that came in from the audience that we want to ask to all three of you. The question is, what are some of the key roadblocks to enterprise adoption of cloud native technologies that you have faced and how have you tackled them? So who wants to go first? Yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, my impression is a lot of it is just, it's a knowledge and a complexity problem, right? And I think, you know, I'll touch on this later, but finding ways, you know, I think if you look at the original wave of cloud native, people were building their own Kubernetes clusters and they were figuring this, like, how do I do all these nuts and bolts? And ultimately how you run and deploy, for example, Kubernetes, is that really what differentiates your offering? Well, not necessarily, right? So you're seeing this rise and trend of, manage Kubernetes and package Kubernetes and those types of things. 
So I think, you know, for us, what we're seeing is we're, we're seeing a lot of that undifferentiated heavy lifting that, that added that complexity, getting, getting reduced and, and folded in. And I think, you know, I think we're starting to see that same move with service mesh, um, which I'll, which I'll probably touch on a bit later, but this like complexity is kind of the enemy, right? How do you let people um, kind of get this agility from these new modern platforms, but in a way that, you know, lets them focus on their core business value, not on managing that infrastructure. Makes sense. You guess. Mark Austin, any of you want to react to that question? I'll add one thing, and I think that it's um, what we deal with in our large customers is just their ability to adopt the technology from a you know, um, there's gatekeepers and big companies. Part of the reason why I have started my own company was was that, you know, things like Kubernetes, which we all know are pretty well-established technologies and large multinational, multi-billion dollar companies that have conservative IT policies. Sometimes it's, it's hard for them to understand that they're going to adopt parts of a composable infrastructure when they're used to buying a solution stack that is all from a single vendor. That's probably, you know, their, their, their staff is willing, but their policies are playing catch up with this emerging tech. Yeah, I think, Mark, that's a really important point. Um, that is, uh, you know, that, that we also see in customers is how do you bring a new set of technology to a customer that's just used to buying it in a certain way in a particular um, manner? And you know that's the that's the challenge, right? That even new business faces. Um, you know, so so we certainly see this across our customers and with many of the startups that we work with. All right. Uh, I'll, just take, uh, yeah, I'll just take you back real quick on on what these guys said. I, I think it's you know it's usually a, um, the roadblock is at the leadership level, and uh, and I get it. You know, leaders today are are just struggling with so much, and they're they're dealing with the. Uh, um, kind of the baggage of uh, legacy architectures and all that maintenance and, and whatnot um, and trying to navigate, you know, the trends smartly here. So, you, you know, it's it's tough, um, you know, for those folks who are considering serverless, like the, the beauty of this architecture is that you don't have to refactor, migrate some huge application. Um, all you have to do is just put a single task in like a serverless function. Right, like one little tiny thing. And this is how it starts. A uh, developer just comes and they bring in like a, a scheduled task, a cron job that does one thing. It could be some little piece of automation, enriching a data record or sending out a, uh, an email uh, on an event or something like that. Um, and just start, start small. And with serverless, you could do that pretty effectively. Because again, one little function, that's all it takes to get started. Thanks, thanks, Wilson. It makes a lot of sense. Um, all right, I'm going to get to uh, the second part of this uh, this conversation, and that's really around open source. Now, all three of you are big proponents of open source and open source community. Um, but Mark, I want to come to you first because you've been, you know, part of the open source community community basically your entire career. You've got a lot of companies, foundations, projects that you've been involved with. So I wanted to ask, what do you think is the most important attribute of open source, and what does it mean for startups? Yeah, I think the 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 biggest you know advantage for a startup is the leverage it provides. Um, I think that the attribute that that is interesting around open source is it can help to mitigate um, risk in adopting new technologies. So when you have things that are like Kubernetes that are supported by all the major vendors in the industry you can adopt a technology and know that it's not going to go the way of a dodo. Um, but for, for a startup, I think the leverage it provides in distribution, uh, development, especially when you're um, combining other open source with it. So non-differentiating technology would be, you know, we, we, we personally leverage um, a JavaScript library is called Vue for our interface. We leverage Knative, which provides the way to serve functions, um, those kind of things. And then we can package that um, with, with some of our, our technology. Um, 
today we are not very open, not because we don't believe in it, but we are working on our sort of strategy around it because we think that that it's a matter of having incentives for not just the company to open source, but the users to participate in the open source and ideally other vendors. Um, and and really the, the advantage and the sort of network effect that we see from open source is when um, there can be a discrete development and not it doesn't have to be coordinated. So if you're a scholar of software development, um, you know, Fred Brooks in his mythical man month said adding more developers to a late project makes it later. That core development is hard to coordinate across a large number of people. But when you have something like Kubernetes, and I was just looking yesterday, um, you know, submitting bug fixes and feature requests, there were 37,000 uh, closed issues on the GitHub repo for Kubernetes, and there's roughly 2K that are open now. That kind of um, many, many eyes makes all bugs shallow and, you know, the collective, collective um, feedback on how to, how to develop the software is all, all very, very interesting to me. And finally, the other thing that I think is important in the days of uh, many new licenses that aren't technically open source, there is sort of a, I'm sort of a purist in the fact that if it's an open source approved or open source initiative approved license like Apache or GPL, but um, Apache is the more popular today. I think that's a really important distinguishing factor around open source is that the licensing is true to the open source freedoms that, that make it an effective uh, technology development model. Maybe just to jump on and put like a really fine point on it. I think it's one yeah. really simple way of, of, of think saying it is, I think open source is the new way that standards are created, right? It used to be maybe you get a standards body, like a network, the IETF, and these big companies come together and they argue for years. You know, think if, if a bunch of big companies had gotten together um, and decided to create a container spec, would it have been Docker? The answer is no, right? But Docker was able to be there, was put it out there in the open source ecosystem. And it's a great way, I think, that that kind of lets, lets smaller companies and smaller players in the space say, hey, we think we know where the world should be going. We're putting it out here. You know, you're safe to take it. You're safe to extend it. You're safe to bet on it. And um, I think it's really like a better way of creating kind of those standards. Kubernetes is a standard now. It's a standard as source code, though, not a standard as spec, right? And I think that kind of open source is building the, the new way to create standards in terms of infrastructure. Makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Stan. That's a super, uh, super relevant point. And uh, now maybe just to just ask the same question or similar question uh, to both you, Dan, and Austin. So you both took very interesting and you know uh, strongly philosophical approaches to building your open source community. Can you maybe talk a little bit, bit more about that? And, and Dan, I see you're laughing and because you know I'm going to come to you first. So. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's interesting because this is something that a lot of, I guess, it sounds like I'm railing on big companies now. It wasn't, wasn't my intent, but it's something a lot, of, a lot of big companies, even some startups get wrong, which is they kind of think like, oh, if I open source something, that's going to go create the mind share and it's going to be, and then I'll, I'll kind of keep the real thing as my enterprise product and people will pay money for that. But I think what's changed is that there's so much real, especially in the cloud native Kubernetes space, there's so much really good open source software out there that you can't release your bad or limited or non-production or no scale or poor performance version open source and expect it to get attention and build mindshare. You actually have to build something amazing and you have to give it away <laughs> and you have to be okay with cloud providers taking that and using it, making money off of it, and you not making money off it. What you're getting is you're getting that awareness and that mind share and that you're part of the conversation, you're becoming part of the standard. And then as a startup, you actually have to come for the second product, <laughs> right? That you can actually charge money for. And so like creating an open source company in this infrastructure space, I always tell people, you have to create two separate awesome products. You can't have a bad version of your product or a limited version of your product that you open source and then a good one that you pay for. So it definitely really raises the bar because there's just so much high quality open source stuff out there today. Thanks, Dan. We all we agree with that. 
Awesome. Big plus one to everything Dan just said. Um, and I, I love building communities and building products and whatnot. And so just to, to add on to what what Dan was speaking about, like building these these great, great solutions and making sure that the open source is a great solution. Um, you know, I think we, we target developers for our community. And, you know, right now, 2021, there's there never been more developers in the world, but there's never been less developer attention. So even if you have that great solution right now, just getting a, a developer to look at it for a few seconds yeah. is, is just the hardest thing, like for any product or you know, community in general, whatever you're building. Um, and so I'm hyper opinionated about this and I've spent a long time thinking about it. And my, my strategy is that you, you know, great communities um, don't come from, from great products alone. You have to have a compelling story. And if you could take a, a fantastic technical solution, open source or commercial, and wrap that in the emotional charge of a story, that's the best way to kind of coordinate people in mass uh, to move in a, in a common direction. And some some examples of that are just in 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 serverless. That the truth behind the serverless buzzword is it has a story built in. And now everyone always says like, oh, serverless, that, what, that's crazy. Of course, it's built on, on servers, right? It's about as technically accurate of a term as, the, as cloud is, right? And so we, you know, it, and in the early days, when I was kind of throwing around this buzzword, it just, there wasn't a category, it wasn't well known, and people were just laughing at me. Um, I remember like the first time I posted something about this project on Hacker News, the first comment was, this is a horrible idea. Right. It's just like, you know, it's like everything about like the, the name and, you know, what we we're trying to do. Um, but I noticed something and that was when you said the, the serverless word to a developer, especially developers who have a lot of PTSD around maintaining really complex code bases and systems and whatnot. They just they just love that word. And it's not about being technically ac accurate. It's about designing for emotional impact. And so when you say that word to a developer, they're just like serverless. That just sounds good. And they can't quite, you know, say, articulate why in the moment, but they feel it um, internally. So like that, I, I noticed that uh, the, you know, cause I, I'm a big believer in designing for emotional impact, even if it's a deeply technical uh, developer tool or product. And I noticed that just talking face to face with developers, you know, or, or, or doing the talks in the early days, you'd see them nodding. Right. And I'm always looking for like, OK, who's nodding and, you know, what am I saying when they're when they're nodding and, and giving the thumbs up and whatnot. And so in, in the early days of the serverless framework, you know, we, we kind of embraced that term. And then because it was an open source project uh, to better tell the story, we use the readme as the medium of this, the storytelling. And in the readme, we went crazy for like making these little badges, decorating uh, the readme with these little badges that said 100 percent server free no servers guaranteed. We kind of like went over the top to create not just another piece of disembodied software in the world, but a movement, right? Something that had this energy that you wanted to be a part of. And it just got developers so, so excited, partially probably because of that PTSD of, you know, managing complex applications and whatnot, but just that, that whole storytelling, I think was really, really successful for us. Um, so I'm a big believer in if you want to you know, build, build community, build a movement, you have to think about a great technical solution, but then figure out what that story is around it. Um, and then, of course, it's just how the heck do you sustain momentum over time in open source? Because, wow, it just takes a lot of calories. you got to burn a lot of calories to keep that stuff going. And so you have to figure out how to do that. And then lastly, um, the product needs to be designed to build community. If you're ever in a situation where you've delivered kind of your open source product, and then you have to think about, oh, how do I market this now? Or how do I build a community? That's, you, you've already missed out on like the, the, the most important thing you have to do. And that is you have to make sure that the product itself is designed to grow community. And so the way we did that was our uh, serverless framework is just a set of plugins. Um, so it's just uh, a whole bunch of plugins and you can write your own plugins to overwrite the core um, or extend it. And I mean, the truth is, it's really just like these, it's just a, a loose wrapper around these, these plugins. But in that was the community growth strategy. We would give the open source community everything they needed to just change the product, bend it to their will, whether it's a unique workflow that they needed to accommodate in their company, um, 
and everybody has a different workflow. So you got to think about that when you go to market with your open source solution or a use case that the framework didn't yet cater to. We just gave the community everything they needed to just um, add into that. So I'd say, yeah, those those are my my three go to solutions. It's you know what's what's the story that we're going to we're going to tell here? How are we going to sustain this momentum over time, and how do we design the product so that it kind of grows itself? Thanks, uh, thanks for that, Austin. And I think just you know, it might be interesting to call out to the audience here that you grew up in Los Angeles and you hung out a lot with movie directors and producers. And I think that story that you're so aware of—that's a very unique insight that you're bringing, you know, to the tech tech industry. And so, just wanted to call that out. That's that's the, that's uh, we find it very interesting. So, well, yeah, I, I wasn't hanging audience, out with, uh, with, with A listers and stuff. I wish. <laughs> but I was around people who design for emotional impact. And you know, if you're, you know, engineering for emotional impact is the same as engineering for anything else, right? And so it was it was interesting perspective to grow up around those people and see that as a formal discipline. Like, you know, every yeah. time a screenwriter is, you know, writing their screenplay, they're thinking about the emotions that the person needs to feel every step of the way. Same with the the director. And I apply that to every everything i do on the product side what is the how do we get them to that emotional moment that's the aha moment and then what do they need to feel next and then um and then just keep putting out those laying out those emotional beats so yeah certainly uh, was a, a unconventional background that that helped in this uh, serverless story yeah, we're definitely inter interested to see how that continues to play out now we've got one audience questions and we've only got four minutes left so Dan and Mark, I'm going to ask the two of you to just quickly respond to this, and then we'll get to the closing uh, question. So question from the audience is, it seems that the problem space is really moving towards the application now, um, bringing to all of these um, you know, underlying tools together in a way that application developers can consume regardless of the underlying infrastructure. What do you see as the role of infrastructure in the future? Maybe Dan? Sure. I mean, I, I think it's actually interesting. It's, it's the role of infrastructures, I think, never been bigger, never been more important. I mean, I think it's the, the, the key thing is, is that you want to minimize the friction from the infrastructure to the application development teams, right? I think that's probably a theme that, that all three of us share, right? The goal um, from that perspective is to kind of, you know, not have to have someone add the security logic to their application that security logic should be part of the platform that is offered to the application team. Not have to add their own observability and logging and tracing constructs to the application, that should be part of the platform. So I think you know, what we're seeing is an incredible amount, or kind of the layer of what infrastructure is, is it's not just access to CPU and storage and memory, it's access to all of those common services the observability, the security profiling, you know, all of that that lets the application developers focus more on building the application and automatically the platform is giving them that observability and those better security properties. Mm -hmm. So I think infrastructure is not going away at all. It's just moving up to be much more aligned with how application developers think about architecting their applications. Awesome. And Mark, any thoughts on that? I think that, that Dan's right, and he said it earlier in our talk, is there's more and more abstraction. I think there's more and more infrastructure in use, but we're touching the abstractions as end users and software developers, and there's less, there's less people able to manage more infrastructure because of toolings and leverage and DevOps practices and, you know, just automation in general. So, so that's, uh, I just agree with what he was saying on the network side earlier on applies for the whole stack. Awesome. So that brings us to the last question for all of you. And we've only got like one minute left. So I'm going to ask you please to keep it to 30 seconds if you can. And, uh, you know, this question is, what's the number one trend or prediction that you see for cloud native in the next year? And of course, if you can't sum it down to one, you know, try so um, Dan, I'm going to go to you first. Sure. I love Austin's point about a story. I think our story is fundamentally about this Linux kernel technology called eBPF that we co-maintain the Linux kernel that lets us totally reinvent the entire Linux networking stack to kind of understand these new abstractions. And I think we've already done that from like a core Kubernetes networking and security perspective. Um, my prediction about where this is going to go next year, and hopefully I have enough 
know, I can control this prediction fairly well. Um, but is that less, you know, the service mesh space is, you know, eBPF is going to enter into the service mesh space and be, you know, the kind of technology that lets service mesh be simple and high performance. And I think that's kind of how we view our next mission over the next year or two. Makes sense. Uh, Mark, how about you go, you go next? Yeah, I think that we're right. Um, we just talked about how everything is abstracted. And I think as machine learning and AI gets better, now that, that we're dealing with these abstractions, we can start to see some more decisions made by artificial intelligence for triage and deployment of certain services. But um, uh, I probably am a little bit ahead of the one year timeline. <laughs> But I feel like at least it's possible now. Makes sense. And then Austin. Yeah, big plus one to the abstractions. Uh, just practically, though, I mean, it's always fun to talk about scale, traction, acquisitions, IPOs, and whatnot. But behind closed doors, I'm having a lot of conversations with management teams about the new norm, and that's volatility. I mean, we've been had massive macroeconomic changes uh, over the past, like, 18 months. And looking back, I mean, I'm certainly biased, but I'm just so grateful to be in the space that, that we're in over at, at Serverless because, you know, it turns out in 2020, it wasn't about scaling up for a lot of companies. Certainly a lot of companies experienced tremendous growth, but scaling down turned, about, turned, turned out to be like just as important. We had companies who couldn't have live events, you know, like travel was gone and whatnot, and their systems just scaled down immediately uh, within milliseconds, and they didn't have to do anything to react to that. And so that was really interesting to learn about. And then second, I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, churn in the industry in terms of like people switching roles and whatnot. And I think a lot of our customers who embrace serverless architectures who didn't have very complex systems that they had to manage were able to, to kind of roll with those uh, team changes much more easily as a result. And so I, th I think um, amazing technology trends coming, but very practically, we're thinking a lot about how to help companies build shockproof software uh, and, and companies. And serverless has just been a, a fantastic solution for that, whether you're running on a public cloud provider or a, you know, a, a, some type of Kubernetes abstraction, um, you know, going with those high level abstractions that keep it simple uh, for your development team, for your entire company is I think gonna be increasingly important just given how much things are changing out there. Awesome. So. I'm going to start wrapping it up now. Um, we're already two minutes over, but that, that's okay. Um, so I think just one or two things to, to summarize the discussion. Um, Mark, I like the point that you made just around how hardware is more important than ever, but it is really about the abstraction and about providing uh, you know, services and tooling to application developers. And that was actually made by multiple times um, on this panel. Um, something, uh, Dan, that you called out that I think really resonated is that open source is the new way that standards are created. You know, that's really a fundamental change in the way that things um, have been happening over the past you know, 30 years. And then maybe to close, uh, Austin, I really liked your comment about, you know, that great communities don't come from great products, they come from great stories. And, and I think this is a great reminder that there's a social and a human aspect to all of the work that we do in technology. And so on that note, I'm going to close this panel. So Ashley, over to you. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Christian. Thanks, Dan and Austin and Mark. Fantastic. Okay, so we're moving into the last segment of the day. This one's a little bit different from the previous segments. We're having a fireside chat with a serial unicorn founder. Um, so to moderate this, I am going to hand it over to Mr. Amit Chattervedi, who is our senior director at Cisco Investments and Corporate Development. Take it away, Amit. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, my name is Amit Chattervedi. I'm part of the Cisco Investments team focused on enterprise networking and cloud. Hope everyone's been enjoying the session so far. I know I have. I've learned a ton over the last couple of sessions. Um, so with this session with uh, Mohit Aaron, the founder of Cohesity, we're gonna we're gonna have a very intimate session and a very intimate chat with Mohit today. Um, and Mohit, welcome and thanks for for joining us. Hey, Ahmed, thank you for having me here. Um, and great to chat with you. <laughs> Excellent. Hey, so we want to focus on your journey as a founder, Mohit. But first off, tell us about Cohesity. What led you to start the company? Yeah, uh, so Cohesity starts by uh, simplifying enterprise backups for our customers. 
but it's not just a backup. It's actually a platform that extends across a customer's hybrid multi-cloud environment. Um, and beyond backups, it can also give other aspects of uh, data management uh, for uh, make them available to the customer. So for instance, customers can store files on us, objects on us, they can do tasks and development, they can do analytics, they can move workloads between the cloud and on-prem and vice versa. And the easiest way to understand what Cohesity does is to draw sort of an analogy to a smartphone, right? A smartphone starts off by being a great phone. But beyond that, it's a platform on which we can also run our GPS and, and a music player and a camera and so on and so forth. So we are a platform for data management. We may start with enterprise backups. But we do way more. Got it. Got it. Data management platform, very strong value proposition. Okay. So, uh, you know, you're, this came up earlier. You're one of the few serial uh, founders, entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. And not only that, uh, you know, it's, it's straight up, you know, unicorn universe, which tends to be very verified at Mosse, right? So I'm sure it was never easy and straightforward. It's always easy to look back and, and, and check status. But what drives you forward? Um, why not retire after the first one? Well, you know, before my first one, my first company was Nutanix. And before that, I was uh, an employee at Google. If I wanted to retire, I could have done that then. But I have really a passion to change the world. Uh, you know, that's what really drives me. And people ask me, why don't you go on vacation? And I say that, well, I am on a vacation. This is fun for me, right? If you think uh, between my two companies, uh, Nutanix and Cohesity, um, roughly, if you map them to an iceberg, right? Uh, Nutanix is covering the tip of the iceberg, which is uh, production stuff. And Cohesity is covering the rest of it, which is data management um, uh, on, on the rest of the data, which is not in production. And so between that, we've kind of covered the whole iceberg. And so that's the passion that drives me. <laughs> that is awesome. That is indeed awesome. Hey, um, so, you know, one of the things that's also unique about you and, uh, and your background is you're an immigrant to Silicon Valley, like a lot of other uh, founders and entrepreneurs who've um, made this their home and, and, and found great success and been able to deliver that lasting impact. Um, so what, what makes the Valley unique in your mind? Yeah, well, first of all, I think um, great companies are springing up all over the place, but I must say, there is something special about the Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, there's just such a high caliber of talent available here. I mean, first and foremost, companies are all about people. And it's just so much more easier to get all those people in that one place, right? The Silicon Valley. Second of all, you can get very elite um, VCs to fund you. I mean, Cisco is also an investor in Cohesity. So you get investors like Cisco and you can just, you know, drive across from your office and, and have a meeting with uh, someone in Cisco. Um, and then there are partnerships that you can strike and it's so much more easier sitting here in Silicon Valley to do that because all the companies that you might want to partner with are also here. So Silicon Valley definitely has an edge and that's why so many uh, great companies come out of the Silicon Valley because it's just an ecosystem and uh, the ecosystem makes uh, new companies come up and thrive in this ecosystem. And that's why I really love being in the Silicon Valley. For, for sure, and the ecosystem is definitely unique. And thanks for mentioning uh, uh, Cisco Investments, you know, being uniquely positioned in Silicon Valley. And we're forever grateful to be partnering with uh, strong entrepreneurs such as yours. So speaking of uh, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship, right? They say it cannot be taught. It can, it can only be experienced through the unique lens of a founder's journey. So what are some of the things you learned the hard way as an entrepreneur? And are there any lessons um, from your previous startup that you applied to Cohesity? Oh, you know, um, it's amazing. I think uh, uh, there are just so many lessons I've learned the hard way. I'll walk through some of them. Well, um, first and foremost, um, you know, you need to be humble. You need to realize that um, great companies are built not as a lone wolf, but in an ecosystem, right? It's really an ecosystem. And the sooner you can leverage that ecosystem, the faster the company will thrive and, and take off. So in my first company, Nutanix, I think we took uh, a long time to strike uh, valuable partnerships. And, and therefore, you know, the, uh, the sales motion was more a mid-market motion to begin with. 
and there was a hard time penetrating the big enterprise uh, because we didn't have the right kind of relationships. Uh, I mean, eventually they got there, but it took them more time to get there. Um, Cohesity, you know, the, one of the learnings that I carried to Cohesity was, hey, let's build those partnerships early. So we've been partnered now with Cisco for, for nearly five years, or maybe a little bit more than that. And so literally one year after we geared our product, we entered into a partnership with Cisco. And it's been qu- quite immense. I mean, Cisco opened doors for us, right? Uh, what's a young company? I mean, five years back, we hardly had a brand. We hardly had a name. Uh, and so you go walk into a big customer and they're like, well, I don't want to work with this no-name company. But then you have Cisco behind it and Cisco saying that we endorse this company. It's become so much more easier to convince that big customer to try our product, right? Um, so that's one of the first learnings. Another learning uh, in entrepreneurship, you, uh, it's all about the people. Um, and, uh, you know, the company gets uh, behind whenever you hire people in a certain area of the company that are not up to the snuff. And, and so you got to really have very strong hiring practices uh, because you make hiring mistakes and uh, suddenly, you know, you're, you're behind. And then that gives your competition a leg up. So, so those are some of the learnings that I've, uh, I've brought forth. But if there's one thing I would like to say, it's humility because every situa- situation is different. It doesn't matter uh, how many companies I have done before, every situation is different. So if I approach every situation with humility, I'll actually learn uh, things and what's right for this company. If I try to be deluded into thinking that I already know it all, I'm going to make a number of mistakes. And I must admit that I made some mistakes early on in Kuhizri when I was deluded in that fashion. And that made me humble. <laughs> and that's one advice I give to any entrepreneur. Just approach every situation with humility. Um, you know, the, there's so much to learn. There's so Every situation is, uh, has new challenges. Uh, and if you just approach it with a little bit of a learning attitude, uh, you'll do well. So those are some of the learnings I like to talk about and what I've carried over from uh, Nutanix to Cohesity and how we've benefited from that. Well, those are some great learnings, Mohit, and thanks for uh, sharing those with us today. I'm sure uh, folks are taking uh, notes and, and would noodle on some of the advice as well. Um, you, you, mentioned, um, you mentioned, you know, the, the team and the people part a little bit earlier in the, in the previous question. I want to double click on that. Um, so when it comes to building a team and culture, what's what's most important to you? Yeah, I would say if there's one word I would say there is um, it's consistency and and a great culture. Um, well, there are two words. Uh, so look, when you're just 50 people in the company, it's very easy to have consistency. Um, you know, whatever one person says, um, the 50th person is going to listen to that and you probably are going to operate the same way. But as soon as you become 100 people and then 500 people and then the 1,000th person walks into the company, well, now, how do you maintain consistency? What one, The culture that uh, one person thinks the company has, the 1,000th person probably has a different um, you know, thing in their mind. They're bringing their learnings from whichever employer they work for. Uh, and they're thinking very differently. So to impart consistency, it's very important to have uh, a strong culture starting with core values. Uh, you know, one of the uh, great books that I recommend is a book called uh, Good to Great, written by a famous author called Jim Collins. And this person actually, uh, this author went and studied so many great companies out there. And one thing that he finds is that all of those companies had very strong core values. And that's one of the reasons why they uh, had outsized returns compared to their competition in, in their space. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what exactly the core values are. The fact that you have some core values and you stand by them and you make a strong effort to imbibe those core values throughout the company is actually what made the difference. It brought that consistency and, and the same culture throughout the world, right? So that's you know, one thing I would say is very important. Then, of course, the culture, right? I mean, uh, uh, we all work hard. This is family away from family. You probably spend, you know, our employees probably spend more time working at Cohesity than they spend working uh, or, or spend time with their families. It's very important for them to think about this as a family. It's not just a job. And um, the 
the culture needs to bring that forth if they feel respected if they feel they're on a mission if they feel it's their company and not just something they're coming in to do a job or to take a salary uh, i think the company is going to thrive so it's really all about the people you know consistency great culture this is what eventually leads to uh, unicorns and and it's people who no one person can make a unicorn it's actually a team effort but if the if the team is all rowing in the same direction uh, there's so much more power to that as opposed to the team kind of operating in different ways and and then everyone is pushing in their own directions and you know that 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 imagine a boat being rowed i mean everyone is rowing in a different direction it's not going to go anywhere but if everyone kind of uh, rows in in the same direction then suddenly the boat can catch uh, can catch speed and go very very far so that's the analogy i like to give and so the, some of the learnings uh, about people great thank you for sharing that yes yeah, sharing a set of core values and the team aligning around those set of core values and one unified vision and one unified direction is just so important and i want to just uh, underline that with a with a big sharpie that we see that all across our portfolio with companies that uh, within our portfolio that succeed they they yeah, as you pointed out no it's spot on they they have a set of core values that they all imbibe and and they're all moving in the right direction generally and that's what makes them stronger together um but related to this we're also going through a very unique time um right now right so how has covid impacted your business how has your team and culture held together uh in dealing with either the headwinds or the tailwinds that have been generated by what's going on right now yeah great question amit i mean uh, you know when the uh, covid really started for us in uh, march 2020 we really didn't know what to expect um you know the thing the world had kind of turned upside down uh you know we were no longer meeting people face to face we were no longer meeting customers face to face um you know all the bonds we used to build in like water cooler conversations were not happening anymore so we didn't know what to expect um, but one thing we did realize is that i think we need to increase the number of uh, the amount of communication in the company uh, to make up for that personal touch that otherwise uh, we would have had i mean heck you finish a meeting in in your uh, when we were in office you finish a meeting and you're walking and then you run into people and then you know have some conversations with them and you start you know building a relationship so that's not happening so you need to make up for that and so we actually started over communicating we um, you know our hr uh, ran a training for our managers to over communicate to proactively reach out to their employees to encourage employees to talk to each other to support each other we provided them with the best of tools possible um, you know whether it's uh, not just the 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 web conference stuff but also um, you know tools to do remote collaboration uh you know whether it was tablets or you know uh, stuff like that so i think we put a lot of focus on communication and then there is also like the, the humans we all crave for um you know some in person touch if i'm feeling bad about something then i need you know my friends at work to hey talk it over so we created opportunities for that we created some off sites uh, literally you can have a virtual off site and talk about anything that but work so we'll have wine tasting events or you know have some cheese events and we'll ship uh, wine and cheese to people and you know just to get together over uh, over web conference so stuff like that so i think that really helped in keeping the team bonded together um and 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 the same went for for our customers i think we um, really finessed the way we worked with our customers and made up for the fact that we weren't uh, talking to them face to face the same worked for our partners uh we started having more communications with our partners and stuff so the net result of it was that you know while it's not the same it's never going to be the same uh, but it comes close uh we have found a way to come close to where we were in terms of that connection and and the uh, the the effect on our business was also unclear i mean heck we don't know where the world is headed in march 2020 but it so happened that uh, you know imagine a customer um hold up in their home unable to go to their offices and watch over their infrastructure they're actually they need simplicity 
they don't need that complicated infrastructure from legacy vendors like EMC and Dell or have you. That actually had our business thrive. Um, you know, actually, so I have not seen a, any customer for the last one and a half years, and yet um, Hazeri has a growth of about seventy percent. We are doing great with actually in partnership with Cisco. Lots and lots of great customers. Jeremy mentioned Skylakes. I mean, they got hit with ransomware. That's one of the things that we do beyond backups, right? Uh, we get the data onto Cohesity, but then we offer ransomware protection. They got hit with the uh, ransomware end of last year. Um, this is a, a hospital uh, in, in Oregon. And, and then they told me that Cohesity and the Cisco pair, they saved us. And they said, you guys saved our patient lives. If, uh, if we had not been able to recover the data using the Cohesity and Cisco combination, uh, patient data would have been lost. We would have to probably pay ransomware and then the hospital wouldn't exist because the ransomware demands were, were pretty pretty high. Uh, and they would just, the chain would not exist at this point. And they were also telling me that uh, there were some other hospitals that got hit, which you know were not our customers. And they kept it all under wraps, and now they're getting sued by, by their patients because they lost the data and whatnot. So this is how important data management and uh, conversations like ransomware have become in this environment, right? Uh, but that has also made our business thrive. Uh, so this pandemic has sort of uh, helped, uh, you know, hasten people's journey to digital transformation and making th things simple. Nobody wants to work with a very a complicated, complex environment and manage the data and sitting in lots and lots, lots of silos, uh, having dedicated people to move them from one silo to the next one. Hey, Cohesity is a distributed system, has Google-like scalability, Apple-like manageability. Just roll it in, just works, and you keep on growing it. And it not just offers backups, but also offers so much more. What's not to like, right? And it runs on um, the best hardware out there, right? Cisco hardware. And we have deep integration with other aspects of Cisco. Um, right, um, like Intersight, uh, you know, integrating with SecureX and a number of other things. So, so that's the benefit to our customers, and uh, that's really what's helping the business. Great, thanks for sharing that. And it looks like the the role of Cohesity pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic has has evolved. It's becoming much much more important, much more stronger, especially in certain verticals. So, it's it's always good to good to hear that the role that technology plays in in the in in helping improve things on Main Street. Um, Cohesity is also a great example of a startup that's uh, very successfully built uh, large corporate partnerships. So, could you maybe touch upon that a little bit, and then what makes uh, the partnership with Cisco work? I know you work pretty closely with our Cisco investment uh, team, also from a relationship management perspective. So. If you could touch upon some of that, that'd be great. No, absolutely. I mean, like I first, I'll say again. Uh, you know, I I, I like to um, say that going like a lone wolf is just going to delay, or maybe you just fail. We like to hunt in packs. Uh, literally, our sales leaders say that you know our sales troops are are hunting in a pack with uh, troops from Cisco, uh, and that's what we like. Right, so the Cisco is not just an investor, but also a partner, as well as a customer of Cohesity, and so we benefited a lot. I mean, uh, you know, a no-name company early on, going into a big customer like uh, you know, I don't know, Walmart, uh, you know, Northwell Health, uh, you know, U.S. Bank. These are all our joint customers, or some of our joint customers. At this point, we have. 300 plus joint customers with Cisco. Uh, you know, I believe, uh, you know, I heard Jeremy say that, you know, Cisco has uh, gained north of $200 million through this partnership. Uh, so those are some of the goodness is actually win-win for both sides. We get introduced by the Cisco team in some of these big uh, customers and we get the credibility that we by ourselves will not have. And Cisco benefits because we are a complementary technology and we help sell more of the Cisco products. So we are integrated, for instance, with Hyperflex. Wherever we go, uh, now a customer has, uh, not only can they buy UCS servers, uh, because our software runs on UCS, but they'll also buy Cisco switches. They'll also buy Hyperflex, perhaps, right? So it becomes a win-win for the partnership. Uh, outside of the, uh, the go-to-market motion, there's all, 
obviously goodness you know the cisco investments team given that they are uh, you know friends with us they're invested in us they um, highlighted the benefits of cohesity inside cisco uh, and that's how these go to market partnerships came into into being and cisco has been very kind to give us access to their events like cisco live um, so all in all we've benefited a lot and um, and this is the nice thing about you know having great partnerships um, like cisco um, it just tr- totally gives us that leverage right we only have so many sales teams but now um, the cisco sales force acts as that extension uh, it gives us that leverage and we can now um, spread our our wings so much more um, and access so, so many more customers there are regions of the world where we don't have sales teams and we totally just sell through cisco right uh, so it gives us so much more access to customers out there that we otherwise won't have and this is the the beauty of these partnerships uh, and i also want to say that uh, you know for uh, the sales people in the audience and other, other people in, in in cisco let's not you know have even a single dollar go to our joint competitors like emc and what not right there's no reason um it should all come to cisco plus plus cohesity so let's make that that possible let's make that really already we've done so much um i mentioned some numbers i mentioned some some names um this is the best in breed product the combination of cisco plus cohesity is absolutely the best that customers can have out there so why let even a single dollar go to our competitors let's get all of it on cisco plus cohesity and we'll both win okay great yeah exactly why let even a single dollar go to competition so that's a great uh, war cry mohit for the for the wolves and the troops all together uh, partnering to uh, to go after the marketplace so what i'm personally thrilled with the partnership and the and the investment and we see great things together and and again thank you so much for making the time to join us today and uh having this really intimate chat with us uh, i'm sure there were uh, several things that uh, the audience took away but i know i'm just conscious of time and i think we are close to wrapping up so thank you again and back to you ashley thank you awesome Thanks, Mohit. Thanks, Amit. Okay, everybody, we've reached the end of Magnetic Cloud. I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who joined um, and also let you guys know your feedback is super important to us. Um, We'll be sending out a survey link shortly after this. Um, We also have it on the screen. Um, Should only take one minute of your time. And actually, the first 30 people who complete it will receive a gift from us. Um, It's a good gift. I've seen the gift. Um, Also, if you want to learn more about Cisco Investments, you can visit ciscoinvestments.com or you can contact our team. We've got the information on the screen. You've heard quite a few of them speak. Um, Very friendly people. You should talk to them. Um, We're ready to talk to you. Just reach out to us. All right. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. I'm so happy to see people. We've managed to be in school this year, but we've worn masks. But we've had a hundred of our students choose to go virtually. I mean, most of you are in what I would describe as the most difficult years of your life, as far as I can tell. Oh yeah, okay, great. How are you doing, man? Do you have a question? What age did you start doing music? I was 11, actually. And we had a teacher at my school. He encouraged me to try and write a piece of music. In my dream planet, Teachers are respected like pop stars, and no tax money is spent on arms. What do you want to do, Trennis? I think about becoming like a country singer. That's like my main dream. Realistically, I kind of want to become something in the medical field. That's amazing, but that's no more or less realistic than being a musician. I'm real and I'm right here. Do any of you write songs? Is this you? Yes, it is. Yes, I was That's wonderful. Well done. You don't get anywhere unless you put yourself out there. You know what I mean? Do you want me to play anything for you? Can you do yellow? Look at the stars. Look how they shine for you. All the things you do. Yeah, they were all yellow. Your skin.
This week it's been such a pleasure to be working with Cisco, talking to students and teachers from all around the world. I want to say thank you to all of you for being inspiring and wonderful. Thank you for all you do. Where will you be in five years? Where will we be in five years? In 25? In 50? Let's be here and here with her and him and they. Let's connect them. Let's connect everyone. Let's deliver technology that gives them access to power opportunity. Let's set a new standard for data security and personal privacy. Let's change the system. Promote equality and fairness in the workplace. Let's tear down the barriers to social justice for a more inclusive world. Let's clean house. Zero carbon, zero waste. Because the health of our family is tied to the future of our home.